Szanowni Państwo, Ladies and Gentlemen, Bonjour Messieurs, Mesdames, um, I'm Norman Davis, uh, an honorary citizen of Wrocław, and today I have the pleasure to be the chairman of this panel, um, where we will be discussing the question of does Christianity uh, have a role to play in uh, helping to solve today's problems. Uh, I learned from the nuncio, who I shall introduce in a moment, that today is the day of Saint Boniface, Bonifacio, um, who has distinguished uh, uh, who is distinguished by being an Englishman who was sent to convert Germany to Christianity. So perhaps an, an appropriate point on which to start. Uh, as you know, the main part of this global forum in Wrocław um, concerns itself with more trivial and more... Um, uh, boring topics like economics and politics. Um, and for the last three years, uh, we have, have followed the idea of organizing a debate uh, that looks at more permanent, deep, deeper problems um, in contrast to the, the current affairs that uh, are talked about elsewhere. Uh, and of course, by uh, taking the subject of the role of Christianity, we, we, um, we have several things in mind. The role of the Christian churches, the role of Christian believers, and indeed the role of Christian ideas uh, in the world today. Are these things just a relic of the past or are they, are they just a prop or a palliative in people's lives or are they still relevant at the heart of all the big questions of the day? Uh, as a historian, I'm I usually start uh, this topic by saying that Christianity, Christianitas in Latin, was once the name uh, both for European civilization and for the continent on which that civilization developed. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that in the 14th century, when the Chinese emperor asked Marco Polo where he came from, apart from saying he came from Italy or from Venice, he would have said, I come from Christendom. This was the concept of the world, of the medieval world in which Marco Polo lived. Christianity, of course, uh, was not a European religion in its beginnings. It came out of the Middle East, as indeed did the other monotheistic religions. Uh, but after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, and in the 7th and 8th centuries, the rise of Islam, uh, the European subcontinent, subcontinent on which we live became the base, the main base uh, for, um, for the Christian world. The original base in the Middle East was taken over by Islam. Uh, and a famous Belgian historian called Henri Pirenne made a uh, well-known sta statement that the empire of Charlemagne was inconceivable without Muhammad. 
the fact that Europe became the base for Christianity is all connected with the rise of Islam. In modern times, however, the name of Christendom has been replaced by the name of Europe, which previously was just a geographical concept going back to the Greeks. And I think it was the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, the beginning of the 18th century, uh, that in international discourse, the name of Europe, the concert of Europe was first used. And the change came about essentially, I think, because the concept of Christianity, Christendom, had fallen into disrepute. Uh, Europe had been involved for several centuries in wars of religion in which Christians fought against Christians. Uh, the Christian community was divided into um, hostile camps, a Catholic camp, a Protestant camp, a, an Orthodox camp. And each of those camps divided very often uh, by different uh, denominations. And of course, the Christian princes, the rulers of Europe, uh, were involved in bloody wars against each other. And because of this, the feeling, people's feeling that they belong to a uh, wonderful Christian community uh, was replaced by uh, this other um, a title of, of Europe. Uh, and ever since, the primacy of Christian thinking has been undermined uh, in Europe. Uh, first by the rule of reason in the Enlightenment, later by the uh, rise of science, people like Charles Darwin, about which I'm sure we'll hear, uh, and in our own times, after the defeat of fascism and communism, both of which were anti-religious movements, the establishment of a secular world in which religion has largely been relegated to the private sphere. Uh, to debate these issues, uh, uh, I'm extremely pleased to welcome three very special guests uh, of the sort that one doesn't meet in Wrocław or indeed in Oxford or other places every day. Uh, the first uh, Immediately on my left, Monsignor Jean-Claude Perisset, uh, who until recently and for many years was a professional diplomat of the Vatican, a truly global figure who has served as the apostolic nuncio in many countries around the world, including, I think, Peru, South Africa, France, Romania, and until quite recently in Germany. We're extremely honored to have you with us. Uh, secondly, playing on the left wing, or from your viewpoint, the right wing, is uh, Professor John Martin, my old friend and colleague uh, from London. Uh, John, uh, in his day job, is a cardiologist with two chairs, one in London, the other in 
Yale in the United States. But he does many other things, uh, far more than the rest of us. Uh, he's a poet, he was trained as a philosopher, uh, and he, in fact, is the originator of these debates. I brought him to Wrocław some five or six years ago, and he so enjoyed the city and the people he met, uh, uh, we decided that we must do something every year to maintain our connection with this city. So once again, John, many thanks for, for joining in this and coming to Wrocław. Thirdly in the middle uh, is our Polish representative, uh, Professor Wojciech Sadurski. Uh, he too is a global figure. I met him uh, about 10 years ago in Australia. Uh, he is a lawyer by training. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Sydney uh, and he maintains connections with the University of Warsaw, where he started. So those are our three panelists. Um, I've asked each of my colleagues to speak for uh, up to 15 minutes. Um, I'll then ask the panelists to react to the different contributions, and then uh, I hope there will be questions from the floor. Monsignor. One does not cut away the roots from which one has grown. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable assistants, Yes, talking to this Wotswav debate within the Global Forum on, of Natural Structure, this quotation from Pope John Paul II, recently recognized among the many saints who forged Christian Europe along centuries, and today St. Bonifacius, give us the frame on which I want to express myself on the role of Christianity in contemporary Europe. One does not cut away the roots from which one has grown. And Pope John Paul II said that when he addressed himself to connationals present on St. Peter's Square at the Angelus Speech of 20th June 2004. I thank Poland, which has loyally defended in the European Forum the Christian roots of our continents from which the culture and progress of our times have de developed. R roots tell more than values, Christian values, as we used to say, because roots bring life within the body they have to feed. Meanwhile, values are separated goods. I understood such difference between values and roots, and the meaning of this word in every debate on Christianity in Europe, in an address given by the philosopher Remy Bragg at a forum on such same topic of the Social Institute of uh, Mönchengladbach in Germany last year. Therefore, I shall present you the role of Christianity in contemporary Europe as a vital process, resulting of a bimillenarian presence of Christianity within the boundaries of Europe. But as it goes 
within the North Atlantic Treaty, I consider this modern treaty as a remake of the old Roman venture around the Mediterranean Sea, when the citizen of Rome could call the Mediterranean Sea Mare Nostrum, our sea. This not only because of the inhabitants of Rome, but everyone being in possession of such citizenship through his birth in a city having received the Roman label, like St. Paul born in Tarsus, and could therefore be judged only under Roman jurisdiction. Mare Nostrum. This means such unity as an importance not only like the NATO Treaty for defensive matters, but for cultural matters, for a common heritage we belong to. Therefore, I would consider Christianity being one, if not the main ground element making the Atlantic Mare Nostrum, without prejudice of other religious or cultural contributions like Judaism, Islam, Illuminism, and so on. On both sides of the Atlantic, the majority of populations in our days belong to Christianity. Unfortunately, divided since the rupture between Rome and Constantinople in the 11th century, and because of the Western breach caused by the Reformation in the 16th century. Therefore, comes out our today's question, are we really faithful to a Christian heritage and patrimony? Do we really let our society draw its life in the member states of NATO, in our laws, in our endeavors from our Christian roots? Sociologists used to call our time a post-Christian era because of the continuing minor influence of Christianity in social, political, cultural domains. This is partly true, but nevertheless, the influence of Christian traditions imbues our daily life, starting with such expressions like God gracious for astonishment, or with liturgical expression for sports events, la grand messe of soccer for the football World Cup, or talking of conclave in case of an election in any groups when candidates, even for managers of financial groups, are said to be papabili, like for the action of the Pope. Well, but such a situation is not sufficient to describe the role of Christianity in contemporary Europe. As I already said, we live in a post-Christian era. It was already the same problematic, but not but for more ground elements of the society at the time of the French Revolution, with its famous motto, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. These three words express on a like level ground principles of the gospel brought us by Jesus. Liberty, when Jesus said, the truth shall let you become free. And St. Paul, abounds repeating how and when we become free in Christ. Equality is the result of the redemption given us by Jesus, as expressed by the same Paul in his letter to the Colossians. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all in all. About brotherhood, I don't need to make any quotation, as love for the neighbor is with love to God himself, a ground pillar of the Christian way of life. This topic on Christian roots of the main principles of the French Revolution has been presented by Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustiger in a booklet, Nous avons rendez-vous avec l'Europe. We have a meeting with Europe. 
May I quote on this topic the address of Pope Benedict XVI to the German Parliament on September 8, 2011, presenting the fruitful synergy between Christianity, Greek, and Roman cultures as roots of European culture. I quote, how do we recognize what is right? In history, systems of law have, most, have almost always been based on religion. Decisions regarding what was to be lawful among men were taken with reference to the divinity. Unlike other great religions, Christianity has never proposed a revealed law to the state and to society. That is to say, a juridical order derived from revelation. Instead, it has pointed to nature and reason as the true sources of law, and naturally presupposes that both spheres are rooted in the creative reason of God. Christian theologians thereby align themselves with a philosophical and juridical movement that began to take shape in the second century before Christ before Christ. In the first half of that century, the social natural law developed by the Stoic philosophers came into contact with leading teachers of Roman law. Through this encounter, the juridical culture of the West was born, which was and is of key significance for the juridical culture of mankind." End of quotation. Let us now come back to NATO, which is responsibility to preserve at least the Christian root of contemporary Europe, if not also to take care that these roots are still alive. Because Christianity belongs to the common patrimony of the great majority of the member states of NATO. The preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty is clear on the ground orientation of the signatory states. I quote, they are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. The treaty itself being a treaty is a mean for sharing common values, many of them being born of the same Christian roots. Like for a tripod, any human institution needs at least three legs for its stability. For NATO, existence and activity, may I consider the three following points as rooted in Christianity, solidarity, wisdom, and realism. Solidarity as a social and political expression of brotherhood. Wisdom, because the main goal of NATO is to defend, protect, and promote a way of life out of and for the best of human nature redeemed by Christ. Realism, because NATO was born at a time which is still ours under other circumstances, unfortunately, of street to this common Christian patrimony. Not without reason, NATO has grown out of a military alliance to a political and societal organization. Was not God himself realistic when he came himself among us through incarnation of the sun to save mankind from destroying itself in sins? Saint Augustine has reassumed this when he says in one of his sermons that the son came to save the work of his father. And in Latin, work is fabrica. If result must be achieved and reached, I don't need to tell strategists of the NATO organization that they need a realistic approach to any situation to take time to consider not only the best means to reach the proposed goal, but also to think on the consequences of the action for people involved. When we talk about the role of Christianity in today's Europe, our first attitude 
is the one expressed by nobody else as Napoleon. Man is great when kneeling before God. We have in European society references to God in many ways, and not only in preambles of the constitution of some states like Poland or in my own country, Switzerland, but also in many mottos, for instance, on the royal seal of the United Kingdom, Dieu est mon droit. What means God first, and I defend my rights according to his teaching. The American coins and currency bear what is concretely an act of faith for acting well. In God we trust. Motto which became even the official motto of the USA as from 1956. Applied first on currency, such motto should always remember to owners of assets that social dimension is attached to all human goods, like often remembered by social doc documents of the Catholic Church. I would dare to overturn the motto if we deal according to God's will, giving us goods for sharing them with others. In us, God trusts. Reading the Holy Scripture, especially the Pentateuch, we are called to take care of the needy, of the poor, of people without any self of protection, like widows and orphans. What an invitation in that respect to an organization like NATO at world level. As not everybody in Europe belongs to the Christian tradition sharing Christian faith, may I apply analogically the kneeling before God of Napoleon and of believers to atheists and agnostics. The atheist is not without guiding principles. While denying God, he puts something else or someone else as guide for his conduct. Was not the atheist regimes imposed by communists to Eastern Europe the first motive for founding NATO in 1949? With the communists, God was replaced by the working class gospel by materialistic values to bridge fully and ultimately on earth. Even if we may agree with such ideology on some points in need of change, like the oppression of workers by unscrupulous masters or, or solidarity among oppressed people, the way of changing the situation does not pass with most profound values like liberty, respect of the person, and so on. For agnostics, sceptics, and other ideologists or not committed people to stable standards of life, facts are their gauge and rule. And they are usually quite realistic. Like runners on the track, they start according to what they see and understand on a concrete situation. And we may often agree with their assessment, even if prudence and more common action with them should help to avoid chaos and uncertainty of their approach to social life. Once again, an organization like NATO has the adventure to bound, to bound a quite different approach towards a common goal for a major benefit of people to which it is committed by the preamble of its treaty. So my time is over, and if the complete text will be published, you will have to, the possibility to read it. Thank you. is the roots are still alive. Uh, I'm afraid that our debate was scheduled at the time before most of the American visitors have been able to arrive. Uh, and I hope somebody will tell them uh, this idea of the Atlantic as the Mare Nostrum. It's a, uh, uh, very pleasant. Uh, now, John, please. Thank you very much, uh, Norman Davis. Uh, I think the, uh, the Archbishop has given a very good introduction to what I want to say, but I want to say something uh, radically different. 
When I was passing through the hall, I picked up this booklet about the Airbus 380. And to me, this is one of the greatest achievements of Europe. The fact that four different European countries can each manufacture a part of this and make it into a plane, which is one of the great technological achievements of the world that, the, that Boeing and the Americans couldn't do, means that Europe can achieve great things. And I agree with the, the, uh, the, the Monsignor, uh, as does the, uh, the, the philosopher from Slovakia, Zizek, who is very popular at the moment, that the European Union is founded on three columns. One is Greek democracy, the second is the, thren the French Revolution, and the third is Christianity, and primarily Christian thought. And I, and I agree with the Monsignor that I think Christianity is more powerful than either the French Revolution or the concept of, of Greek uh, democracy. But the problem is a great fracture has occurred at the center of European thinking. In the 12th century, the University of Paris was a boiling cauldron of debate about what was a human being, what was God, what was the relationship of the human being to society, uh, with lots of diverse opinions being respected and put together. And that formed the thinking of the Catholic Church over the last thousand years, but also the thinking of Europe in the, the role of women, uh, civil society, and in my own field, I'm a scientist, causality in science occurred there in a way that an understanding of scientific causality has not occurred in, in Islamic societies. Then, at the end of the 19th century, science occurred with our ability to measure things to a smaller and smaller level and predict the future of the uh, physical world. Uh, and this has become very, very popular. Every week on television we have wonderful programs about how distant star stars can explode and give rise to new universes. This science is a truth. The ideas coming out of the University of Paris with Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century is a truth. The problem is that the Catholic Church has not taken part in an integration of that essential thinking that founded Europe with the modern scientific reality. And uh, I, I feel this very much, Chairman, because I read nearly the whole of Aquinas in Latin when I studied philosophy, and I now write papers on the molecular biology of how cells work in the heart at the level of physics and molecules. Now, the effect of this is that individuals in society are seeing their internal destiny more and more as a physical destiny and not a spiritual destiny. I think one uh, consequence of this, for example, is in economics, when in part, it is now considered true that the economic disaster of 2008 was due to too much quantitative thinking about how money works, as opposed to qualitative thinking, a thinking of ideas which started in a thousand years ago in, in Europe, ideas without quantification related to how things work. So this fracture in European thinking between idea and abstract concept and the measurement of science uh, has affected the evolution of the European Union. And there is not an appreciation that what voters, citizens, people want is not only economic wealth, which Aquinas says is necessary for happiness, but also they want an internal destiny related to their own individuality about where they lie in the universe. 
The European Union could have given this if church thinking had have helped, and that has not occurred. So the concept that the physical world is its own destiny uh, has become rife in, in European thinking. And the combination of a spiritual world with a scientific physical world has been completely lost. In my own university, the philosophy department no longer studies metaphysics, but the philosophy professor has become a sociologist, which I think is, is a disaster for, for learning. So I think that the European Union has lost a purpose in giving a moral destiny to individuals on top of the necessary economic defense and political destiny. And I think this has led to self-doubt in Europe and the recent European elections, I think, are a manifestation of that. People are now looking back into nationalism, the rise of right-wing parties, give a quasi-spiritual destiny, uh, I think a very false destiny, but I think it's a consequence of this fracture in European thought between abstract thinking of a thousand years ago and that tradition and modern science. The United States has moral uh, debility. When I go to Yale, where I, I, I work, as well as in London, I see that my colleagues, doctors working there, who are liberal men, have a different approach to life compared to me. I stay with the professor of cardiology in Yale, uh, Mike Simons, that, that you know. <clears throat> the last time I said, said, John, I have to tell you where the guns are. There's a revolver by the front door, it's loaded. There's a revolver at the kitchen door, and my wife and I have a revolver in our bedroom. I said, Mike, that's in, that thinking is impossible in Europe. But even the most right-wing conservative, you wouldn't justify your wife having a revolver in the bedroom. I had dinner with 12 of my colleagues in Yale from various faculties, and they were discussing a murder that had occurred. They were all looking forward to the murderer being caught and executed. I said, but your professors in a liberal university, do you believe in capital punishment? Of course we do. I said, this conversation is impossible in Europe. China is the victim of raw materialism without any abstract qualitative thinking. <clears throat> and Africa, uh, where, where I have also worked, is a complete disaster of corruption, tribalism, and violence. And I see the future of the world could be helped by the European Union offering a moral destiny to the world. But that would require a combination of qualitative idea thinking with modern science. Now, in my own life, I, I, I told the Monsignor last night at dinner, they had to excuse me because I was a very bad Catholic and I was divorced. And in my own life, I get spiritual consolation from a combination of Shakespeare, Wagner, and Freud. But that can't help me with the origin of the universe, what the whole thing is about, where the whole universe is coming from and where it's going to. Wagner only deals with that in a very trivial way. And my colleagues who are hardcore scientists in London are developing a new dogma of the world whereby our thoughts are only electrochemistry in our brain. That free will doesn't exist. It's only a legal construct to try and control society. That our existence only has meaning insofar as we give our genes to the next generation. That's it. Reproduction is the only event that is important for human biology. And finally, the world is meaningless. 
What I've just said is shocking to you, I can see that, but I deal with this every day over coffee in my university. That will become the thinking of the European Union because of the power of science unless there is a change in the relationship between the origin of abstract thought that occurred in the church, in Paris University in the 12th century. And I think that what I've just said to you about what my <clears throat> colleagues believe can only lead to depression because there is no thinking about the human being outside the molecular <clears throat> and outside putting my genes with the genes of a woman to produce a new individual. That is human destiny. Now, <clears throat> the church has failed Europe. It has failed to understand science. It has failed to take part in this great interaction between idea and measurement. It has taken part in making this fracture in European thought. Uh, from the time where Giordano Bruno was burnt through saying that there were many sons and they all moved, the, there has been a castration of European thought that in part was caused by the conservatism of the church. Uh, an emphasis on things which were only secondary, for example, sexual morality uh, over the last hundred years has become an enormous topic in the church. Whereas what I really want to know about is if God exists, what is God? If I have a soul, what is a soul? Aquinas took the Greek philosophy of Aristotle who was a pagan and integrated it into church thinking. Augustine took the Greek philosophy of Plato and integrated it into church thinking to make something far richer for the church and the understanding of what Christianity is. Why did the church not take Darwin and integrate Darwin into church thinking? For me, Darwin is obvious. It's just a mechanism. It's like how I breathe or my blood circulates. It's a thing how biology advances. There's no threat there to the church or to God. If you believe in God, then God created Darwinism. It's obvious to, to me. Darwinism should have been integrated. Now, Pope Francis talks about love, and I think this is terrific. I think he is a great advance, but it is too little and it is too late. I think God can be defined in a new way. If the Big Bang caused the universe, the cause of that Big Bang is what I call God. The speed of light had to be present before the Big Bang, otherwise mathematically it doesn't work. And therefore, the speed of light has to be in God. Obvious. Why didn't the church take that? Say, well, this is wonderful. Let's get together with physicists and talk about the nature of God and the nature of the speed of light. <clears throat> I believe that the human soul, I'm a hardcore scientist. I believe I have a soul. I believe that soul arose from the complexity of Darwinian evolution, was not breathed into me by God but arose out of Darwinian evolution. Fabulous concept. Why didn't the church grasp that? <clears throat> Even the Annunciation of Christ. I was thinking about it recently. If God put the nature of God into the womb of a virgin, then all the constants, like the value of pi, Avogadro's number, the speed of light, must have been placed in the womb. It's fantastic when you think about it in terms of physics. But there may have been other constants that existed before the big, big Bang that exist in the universe that weren't expressed in this present universe that God might have placed with the constants we know in the womb of the Virgin. What a fantastic theology of the Annunciation, Monsignor. Why did the church not roll up its sleeves and get to grips with, with modern science? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is more important than what is happening in eastern Ukraine. The next few days, uh, Chairman, is going to be a discussion between heads of states in this room. 
politicians, diplomats, mostly about what the hell is happening in Ukraine. What is Putin doing? Of course it's important. But for the European Union, the most important thing is to try and sort out this moral relationship between science and uh, thought. And that is the most important thing for the next 100 years. Christianity has been absent. Protestantism is a joke. Uh, the Reformation was needed, but Protestants, in their ability to believe whatever they like, is clearly ridiculous to, to, to a scientist. Only the Catholic Church, I believe, has the moral authority and thinking authority to be able to uh, confront uh, science. But I think it's probably too late, Monsignor. I think the church has missed the boat, as we say in English. Unless perhaps Pope Francis could get together a task force of Jesuits, a uh, hundred, uh, I nearly said men and women, but they're all men, aren't they? A hundred men who would get together and really try and think this through. And perhaps the present European crisis, crisis of nationalism, of the rise of right-wing parties, might be a time when within the European Union, a uh, truly intellectual Jesuit uh, uh, approach could be applied to Catholic thinking with science. Uh, so the alternative, Chairman, is fragmentation, perhaps fragmentation of Europe, uh, fragmentation certainly of, of Christianity and Christian thought. And I think that it's time now for the church to assume its responsibility and put the beauty of this Airbus together with the beauty of uh, Aquinas's thought. Thank you. inviting me to this debate. I moje serdeczne podziękowania także dla organizatorów tego forum i tej dyskusji za ich wspaniałą gościnę. I would like to uh, raise two points, or to address three questions in my short presentation, which will be much more, I'm afraid, specific and down to earth than these uh, intriguing and fascinating reflections by John, to which I may perhaps return in the discussion. So first of all, I would like to talk about uh, specifically the question that Professor Davis raised in the title for this uh, panel, and that is whether Christianity can solve, can help solve Europe's problems. Secondly, I would like to say a few words about the relationship between Christianity and the European project, in, par in, particular, uh, in particular the European Union. And finally, because we are here, the, uh, I gather, and I've actually not just gather, I know from Professor Davis that was one of the reasons I was invited to say uh, a few words about the Polish Catholic Church. So let me start with this question, can Christianity solve or help solve or contribute to solving Europe's problems? And obviously, in order to answer that question, we must first identify what those Europe's problems are. But I hope that you will excuse me, perhaps even will thank me for not trying to now elaborate a list or a litany of, of Europe's problems. Let's assume that more or less there is a degree of consensus about what the fundamental issues, fundamental economic, social, foreign policy, strategic, etc. problems in Europe are. And whatever they are, whatever is the list, then probably will say that they would fall into two categories. One category of problems are such that I'm not sure that Christianity as such, as Christianity, has any determinate, conclusive answers to the answers stemming from the gospel or from Christian teaching. 
uh, or from the doctrine, so to speak. So when we think about some of the issues about which we discuss and which, about which we read in newspapers, which we identify as Europe's problem. For example, the recent fiscal crisis of the Eurozone, which of course also uh, contaminated a large number of countries uh, outside the Eurozone itself. Or when we think about the problems of unemployment, or even collapse in a number of countries of the social security systems, etc. Of course, Christians have a number of possible answers to this, but these answers will fall on all sides of ideological divides. And I'm not sure, again, I don't want to pretend that I'm a great expert in, uh, in Christian teaching, but I do not think that there are any conclusive and determinate answers which, uh, which are triggered or stem from Christianity as such. Christians have answers to it, but not necessarily as Christians. But I think that there are also some issues, which we, some truly dramatic issues that we face in Europe, to which Christianity has, or at least should have, quite a determinate answer. Because they actually resonate with the deepest message of Christianity. This message may not be exclusive to Christianity itself, but obviously Christianity has moral and intellectual resources to address those issues. So that when you think, for instance, about various aspects of extreme suffering of people such as migrants, including so-called illegal migrants from outside Europe, who try to find their place here, often not just to lead affluent or even decent life, but just to live. When we think about refugees, when we think about people who are held often in horrible conditions and for indeterminate time in various detention centers, when we think about those 10 to 12 million of Roma who face daily intolerance, discrimination, often hatred, not necessarily by the government, but by societies. In other words, when you think about all those others, who are others in terms of place of origin, or their ethnicity, or color of skin, or, uh, or religion, uh, then I think these are the issues on which Christianity does and should have a clear answer. There was only a few weeks ago, um, a very interesting and quite heartbreaking, I must say, report published by Secretary General of the Council of Europe. So we're not talking now about the European Union, it's Council of Europe, uh, which basically puts together all sorts of data and information about the decline in the protection of human rights in Europe including on all those issues which I have just mentioned, plus many other issues, such as domestic violence against women, which, as Secretary General there say, is perhaps a matter of the most widespread violation of human rights in, in, in Europe. And I, I suppose and I know that these are the issues which strike at the very heart of Christian teaching. And the question is, is the church's voice, both at pan-European level, but also in particular countries where it happens, sufficiently loud and clear. Uh, is there a clear resonance with what the Monsignor called here fraternity, or the aspects of solidarity, which after all go back to the parable by Jesus Christ about Good Samaritan, the parable which was meant to be an answer to a question by a lawyer, but who is my neighbor? And Christianity, as far as I understand it and feel it, gives an answer to this question, who is my neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor when they need it. Wherever they come from and whatever their origins is. So the question now is, if that's the case, if there is this aspects of universality which transcends all sorts of tribal and other divisions, this aspect of compassion 
Love and solidarity with the suffering. If it is something written into Christianity, do institutional churches raise these issues sufficiently, again, loud and clear, in order to help solve these Europe's problems? Now, I will, I will not try to provide an answer. I just, I just ask the question. And it seems to me that, for example, here in Poland, when occasionally some pretty horrible things happen, for example, to migrants and refugees. Just a few days ago, we've heard about this uh, Vietnamese refugee who I think already has been or is about to be deported back to Vietnam where he faces pretty horrible uh, fate. Of course, it's a matter for everyone, every decent human being. But it also is a matter for the church to make its view sufficiently clearly known about it, because I think that Christianity, yes, can help solve these types of Europe's problems. The second point I would like to talk about is the relationship between Christianity and the quote-unquote European project, by which I mean mainly the European Union, but also the European project as encapsulated by the Council of Europe and the whole European Convention of Human Rights System and other human rights conventions uh, under the auspices of the Council of Europe. And there is clearly certain ambiguity here, and that is understandable ambiguity. On the one hand, if we now talk about the European Union, uh, there is a reason to believe that some very important roots and sources of the European integration are Christian, and that some of the most important founding fathers, as they then were, of, the European, of what became European Union were Christians. And it's not just that they happened to be Christian, they actually were clearly motivated in their vision by Christianity. So there is a good deal of resonance between institutionalized Christianity in Europe and the European Union. And I remember, I've read before this session uh, materials of uh, an important conference which was held in Krakow, I think, about two or three years ago, where the Archbishop of Luxembourg uh, participated, and he made this extremely impassioned plea for more Europe, for federal Europe. So that read like some of the most Euro-enthusiastic uh, enthusiastic type of statements, and actually, there was an interesting exchange between him and the then Polish Minister of Justice, Mr. Jarosław Gowin, uh, who actually said, no, 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 we don't want actually a federal state. We are not, uh, not uh, in favor of more Europe. So that was almost like a debate within the family, within Christian family. So on the one hand, there is this sense, yes, that was originally a Christian project. But on the other hand, there is a great deal of suspicion that the European project, as it is now, carries certain ideological message which is potentially hostile to Christianity. That this liberal modernism and secularism, which undoubtedly is part of the way today's European Union projects its ideology, is something that the, Christian, that the institutionalized Christianity is very concerned about. And one aspect of this concern, about which in turn I am quite concerned about, is not just ecumenical, but also political rapprochement between the churches, including the Vatican, but also a number of national Catholic churches, and Putin's Russia, which can be seen in all sorts of ways, in which not only for reasons of uh, as I said, ecumenical drive, which goes back to Vaticanum Secondum and which was given such an impetus by John Paul II and then Benedict XVI, and was very much carried over by Pope Francis. Uh, and obviously you cannot have rapprochement with the Russian Orthodox Church without being friendly to the government because of such an entanglement of the Orthodox Church in Russia with the Russian government. But also I'm afraid it has some deeper and more invidious, at least invidious for liberals, like myself, uh, aspects. And that is that there is a sense that Russia is perhaps the only big state in Europe which is 
ideologically and openly hostile to this liberal modernism, to the idea of strong human rights protection, to the idea of respect for diversity and freedom of choice. So there is a specter, I would say, of certain unholy illiberal alliance between these trends in the church which are so openly suspicious of modernity with, uh, with, the Russia, with, with Putin's Russia. And if, we, if you read some of the statements arising out of the meeting of Polish bishops with the Patriarch of Moscow in summer 2012, uh, you will see what I mean when I talk about those illiberal, anti-modernist fear. And that brings me to the last point, that is to the question of Polish Catholic Church. There is an interesting story to be told there. A story about the road that over the last 30 years the church traveled from its opposition to communism to, the, to today's opposition to state or liberal state, to liberalism. In some ways it's quite understandable. When the main enemy, the only, the supreme enemy was the communist state, it really didn't matter all that much what were the motives of this opposition. When the demo democracy came, when it didn't come, it was won, uh, then these differences became important. However, I would suggest that this legacy of hostility to the state, le legacy that goes back to communist period, informs much of the behavior and conduct and practices of Polish Catholic Church. Except that more than 30 years ago, the purpose was to oppose and combat the state. Today it is to capture the state. Now I'm using deliberately an exaggerating concept capture the state, control the state. But much of what happened since 1989 in the relationship between the state and the church in Poland may be explained under this framework of, or under the concept of an attempt to capture the state. And if one reads and studies the attitude of Polish Catholic Church to the Constitution, for example, and its opposition to clear and open announcement of the separation of state and religion, or state and church. If one thinks about the way religion was put or and included into public schools, when one thinks about the attitude of states to all sorts of moral issues as handled by law, including the questions of bioethics, sexual ethics, etc., abortion, civil unions. If one thinks about the question of restitution of church's property, taken away by communists and sometimes by much also earlier regimes, uh, then one will see that much of this relationship has the nature of an attempt to control and capture the state. And here the problem in these relations is not the church, the problem is the state, which has been weak and which hasn't offered sufficient type of resilience perhaps resistance would be an even better word, to these to this attempts. And that all happened against the background of fundamental changes within the Polish society. Not so much secularization. There has been, I think, by and large, relatively little by the way of secularization. Although sociologists suggest that when it comes to, to the, say, such indications as attendance, church going and attendance in masses that it peaked at 55% of population around, I think, 1995, and then they slowly declined. But it's not so much the question of secularization, it's the question of growing liberalization of attitudes in Polish society. So that there, there is this growing gap between religious teaching, at least of some trends or some fractions in Polish church, and the attitudes of the majority of people. So to finish, uh, there, that has produced this, on the one hand, this type of 
attitude of fundamental suspicion and hostility towards the state, combined with, with growing liberalization of attitudes among Polish population, grew to certain paradox that the church has certain fundamental problems with participation in the democratic game of, in the political system. On the one hand, it uses often an argument of special democratic major, uh, legitimacy to influence and affect the laws because so such a great number, usually 95% is the number that is given in these uh, uh, and these uh, claims are Catholics, and therefore that gives special, if you like, super majoritarian legitimacy. But when the church sees that certain of its positions are not actually shared by the majority, whether it's the question of in vitro or certain liberalization of abortion, etc., it says, well, really the majority doesn't matter because we will not vote on uh, moral issues, and therefore it, it oscillates between this democratic and transcendental argument. There is a certain ambivalence and contradiction there, I believe, which just suggests that in those countries in Europe, to finish, where the church has for, year, for years or decades or centuries was just one of the belief and ideological forces and had to find its place in the pluralist, pluralist debate, it came to terms much better with the change changes in the society and societal views, then in those countries, such as in Poland, where it has exercised its hege hegemonic position in the sort of like struggle for hearts and minds of people, and has big, big problems in actually coming to terms with the modernity. Thank you. And I thought I ought to make a little um, diversion for two or three minutes. Um, uh, it's already been mentioned that uh, in this forum, the question of Ukraine will be very prominent. There will be many discussions about it. And I thought it, uh, uh, having heard what's been said, uh, perhaps an obligation for me as a historian, very briefly, uh, to remind you of the religious factor in this crisis in Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, one of the central problems uh, is why Ukraine is different from Russia. Uh, the Br Russian view would be that Ukraine is really part of Russia. Vladimir Putin made the famous state statement that Ukraine is not a proper country. Um, and why does he say that? And why uh, do Ukrainians resent that sort of language? And one of the answers is concerned with religion. So very briefly, um, just a little bit of history uh, from the Ukraine. Um, if we go back a thousand years and more, when Christianity came to Kiev, uh, it, it came from Byzantium. Uh, and many of our books um, talk about orthodoxy as though it was just a monolithic denomination of Christianity uh, like the Roman Catholic Church uh, tries to be. Um, but the original orthodoxy of Kievan Rus was Byzantine. That is the people of Rus recognized the patriarch of Byzantium, of Constantinople, as the supreme head of their church. Uh, and at every step, 
uh, in later times, when the Muscovites, as they call them, the, uh, the Russian state, later the Russian Empire, takes over the lands of Ukraine, the Byzantine Orthodox are forced, they're coerced, to change their allegiance from the Patriarch of Constantinople to the Patriarch of Moscow. In other words, religion has been used as a political weapon from the earliest times. Uh, another important episode in Ukrainian religious history happened in the 16th century when the whole of Ukraine, the whole of Ukraine, um, was in the Kingdom of Poland. Uh, in the Union of Lublin, uh, uh, Sigismund August took the whole of Ukraine from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and made it part of the Kingdom of Poland. And in that period, fearing uh, the increasing encroachment of Moscow, a large part of Ukrainian Ruthenian Orthodox, as they would have said at that time, created a new church, i.e. the Greek Catholic Church, often known as Uniates. And this is a church which preserved the original <coughs> Byzantine ritual, the Byzantine rite, uh, whilst uh, adopting the allegiance to uh, the Pope of Rome, the papacy, as the head of their church. So it's Greek because of its Byzantine origins, uh, um, Orthodox, um, Catholic because of its allegiance to the Pope. And this uh, church is uh, the dominant religious uh, institution in Western Ukraine. Uh, and there is no church in Europe that has been more severely uh, persecuted than the Greek Catholic Church at every step. Whether it was the Tsar of Russia or whether it was Joseph Stalin, every time Russian forces entered uh, Ukraine, the Greek Catholics were persecuted, their priests were killed, their um, faithful believers were forced to join the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, now, um, I must be um, uh, quick. When Ukraine regained its uh, independence from the Soviet Union, its second time it, it um, became independent, the first time was in 1918, the second time is in 1991, uh, the persecuted Christian churches revived. Uh, the Greek Orthodox Uniate Church was restored in Ukraine and it's now uh, quite active um, in Lvov, Lviv. There's a Greek Orthodox cathedral beside uh, the, um, uh, the Catholic cathedral. Um, secondly, uh, there arose a, an independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And last of all, there is a Russian Orthodox Church, which still recognizing the Patriarch in Moscow, uh, which, um, as in Russia, has been revived. Um, so you, you have three... Um, uh, principal branches of orthodoxy in Ukraine. Uh, and I'd be very interested, I'd ask you to listen to the debates which will take place here, whether anybody uh, will uh, discuss the religious factor in the present crisis. Um, uh, it's one of the things that, uh, that unfortunately get f forgotten. Uh, but back to our debate, uh, I shall ask each of the 
panelist for a very quick comment, a couple of minutes uh, uh, of their reaction to what they've heard, and then I shall ask for questions from the floor. If there's still somebody here, but I can see people are not asleep, which is very good. Uh, Monsignor. May I first say that I can say, take a constatation that every one of us express what his, his own uh, attitude within the society and the world. The scientist, the doctor, the jurist, the historian, and myself as a priest and bishop for face problems. And it's good that our dialogue comes from different point of view because no one may uh, uh, embrace the whole reality of the world. May I just first tell to John Martin that I give you the suggestion to read the volumes of the Academy of Science of the Holy See, where they approach many of the modern problems, even on dialectics and so on, on uh, so, uh, sociology problems in the world, here and there on politics. And you will find that the church has already, in earlier time, especially the papacy, has been a supporter of science within the history. And here in Notre I don't need to say that Copernicus, who was a priest, uh, was not condemned with his ideas, but even supported. And the main support of, of Galilee at that time, he was a follower of Copernicus, but the Pope himself, because the Pope was interested in science. And if you read the many talks of Pope Pilate and Pilate on uh, science progress, you will see he even gave to some meetings some practical scientific orientation. And therefore I believe uh, this is, uh, I don't agree fully, we can do more on that. But now, when, when you say the church, and every one of us, we are the church, all of us, you, you baptized member of the Catholic Church, or of your own church. Hmm? And we have to do it. It's not only the hierarchy, the Pope and the bishops and the priests who have to do that. Now, to the jurist, uh, I fully um, agree with you when. Uh, we don't have to solve the problems in Europe. And as a diplomat of the Holy See, I always used to say, on technical and practical problem, even on strategists, and when I was working in the Holy See in, in Rome during the war in Bosnia, we had some delegates of the American government to see the point of the the Holy See, if we can help to solve uh, this problem, I say, we are no strategists. We just remember you the moral problems. We have to do some things to help the Bosnian people not be uh, eradicated fully by uh, the Serbians. We must find a dialogue. But we did not suggest any solution. We had our own, own idea and solution proposed by the politicians, but we don't, it's not our role. It's why I agree with that, and uh, I'm fully uh, also in line with you that uh, Christianity uh, as a role, because Christianity in its own uh, identity is an integrating force, as I uh, said in my own uh, presentation. Therefore, uh, now on Ukraine, I know quite well all these problems because I was in charge in Rome of the desk for ex-Soviet Union. And I visited three times Ukraine. I was member of the Dialogue Commission Rome-Moscow for religious affairs, not for political. And I knew well Patriarch Kirill because he was the head of the Russian delegation. 
And we went to see concretely what happens on the spot. And we could tell to our Russian friends and brothers that their assessment did not reflect what happens on the ground. It's therefore what happens today. Uh, I am not surprised with the reaction of Russia for the problem of uh, Ukraine and also of the role of the Oriental Church or, and of our church in Ukraine in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, quickly. Uh, very, very, quick, very quickly, because I want some challenge from the floor. Uh, I, I think the other two speakers uh, have spoke very well, but they've been mostly historical and pragmatic. Uh, the, the Monsignor gave a wonderful, wonderful <coughs> historical analysis of the relationship of, uh, of the Church to Europe. Uh, and, and, and Wojtek, you, you spoke for example, about the Vietnamese refugee. You don't need Christianity to solve that problem. That's a problem for social workers and government money and civil organization. I think the question is, does the church have any role in modern Europe? I think it does, but I think that role is primarily as a source of original thought, Monsignor, based upon the tradition of a, of a thousand years. The very fact that you say, you say just I read the volumes of the Academy, the volumes are there in Rome gathering dust. There is lack of leadership from the church in applying concepts of an integration of Christian thought and modern scientific thought and Darwinism to modern society. A lack of leadership in the church and a lack of leadership of the Catholic intelligentsia like myself and Norman and Wojtek. Uh, we, we, have, we have ignored the problem. I think the problems, we didn't say what the problems were, just I jotted them down. The problems of Europe, I think, are one, solidarity of the members of citizens in relation to the nature of the European Union. I'm a federalist. We don't have solidarity. That could come from, in part, from Catholic thinking. Internal personal destiny. I said that quite strongly, you, did, you, none, you, you didn't address that. What I want is to know what I am about and where am I going. I now understand my heart and my guts and my brain. I'm a scientific doctor. But what am I? That is not solved for me. Wagner doesn't solve it. Shakespeare doesn't solve it. The church perhaps could solve it and is not taking up that challenge. And thirdly, Islam. The, the separation of church and state is essential to, to, to Catholic thinking. It is absent from Islam, that should be said. But, well, I have an enormous Islamic problem in my country, a Monsignor, so does France. That is not being combated with an alternative philosophy and analysis of the barbarity of the Quran, as opposed to the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament, which is immensely beautiful. All these things, I think, need dealing with, but we're lacking in leadership, both from the church and from what remains of the intelligentsia of Catholic society. Thank you, uh, Wojciech. I would like just to very briefly, and maybe for the sake of, uh, of suggesting a discussion, would like to pick up the point that John made about the concept of moral destiny of Europe. What does it mean that Europe has a moral destiny. And the only way I can read it is that there is a certain set of moral values which are more or less consensual and which we believe are important and attractive, but which are missing elsewhere. And therefore we have a duty either to proselytize or to help spread or at least project those values on others for them to take. Now, uh, a number of those others that John referred to are clearly non-democratic countries, so we don't know what real values of society there are. Uh, and the first thing for Europe to promote is democracy as such, talking about China, many countries in Africa and Middle East. But there was also a, a mention of uh, the United States, which is a thoroughly democratic country. And, and John said, well, there are certain values that they have which we don't, we have put off the agenda and off the table, such as 
death penalty or gun ownership. And one may add a number, perhaps, of other clear distinctions between a European consensus and a more or less American consensus, which is much more individualistic and much more oriented towards private individual rights, as opposed to more collective, moralistic, and sometimes even paternalistic approaches in Europe. Now the question is, is it really our destiny and our mission to tell Americans that they should do away with death penalty and do away with unlimited gun rights and these other things? I don't like their attitudes, but it is really our destiny to proselytize our values to them? That's just a question mark for the debate. Thank you very much. Um, I think we still have a few minutes before the, um, the session has to close. It's now your turn. If there's anybody who wants to speak, could you raise your hand and um, say who you are? Uh, is there a microphone for the people? On? There's a microphone will come to you. Say who you are. And if you wish to address one of the panelists, uh, please say who you wish no, to. Norman, can I suggest ladies first, since we don't have a woman on the panel? Yes, uh, yes, of yes, the yes. many hands up, there's yeah, a lady yeah. down yeah. there. Yes, um, it was one of the points. Uh, my name is Kasia Gabriel, and I'm European expert on drug addiction. <clears throat> So at first, I, with great respect to all the speakers, I want to say that very often, unfortunately, you diverted from the main subject. And the main subject is if Christianity can solve European problems. One of you was referring more to the uh, church structure, another you, John Martin. I think it was a question of philosophical existential idea of living why I am living for and how I, I can solve it. So, I mean, it was also, uh, and also another thing, uh, when you spoke uh, at first, at the end, you said something like, uh, probably it will never happen. I mean, in philosophical and uh, in uh, prospective thinking, we never can use the word never, also in science, or always, that's the first point. Because the mystery of God is very near the mystery of science. Uh, when uh, Professor Sadorsky, I think you, you, you talk too much about the Catholic Church, especially Polish Church. It also is not the subject. And uh, uh, the subject is about all Christianity. So I, would, I am a Catholic, but I would not absolutely distinguish between Catholics or Protestants. We in Europe, we have these Christian roots. We have these Christian values to whom you always can look in, just having a Bible and reading the scripture and having a common sense. Because I think what happened now in Europe is just terrible laziness and terribly uh, tenden tendency to just to have pleasure and, and in fact, to, uh, to, take, to, to put the responsibility on something else, on something, somebody else, not on us. So we should become slowly to be mature people, not all the time, the children who need the lead of church or who need the lead of somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. I think John was in the firing line as much as anyone. I, I, I agree. Uh, never and always should not be used. And I say that in medicine to my students all the time. I, I, I agree with you. But I was saying that as a challenge. We're lacking leadership of quality. And that's why I was putting the, uh, the hypothesis that perhaps it's never going to happen as a stimulus to the Monsignor to go back to the Vatican and say, hey, there are people in Wrocław who think that we are completely lost and we've failed. That was why I was saying never. May I intervene? Yes, absolutely. I don't think we are lost. If you read the letter of Pope Francis for the joy of the gospel, he invites every one of us to reflect on what means faith in his life and to be active in life. If you read the documents of the Second Vatican Council, you have, especially in Gaudium et Spes, what are the roles even of scientists, of politics, of everybody in all in his, uh, human responsibility. And for me, the main point in answer to your question is the na uh, notion that the uh, idea of God. Do we believe in God? It's why I quoted Napoleon 
the man is great kneeling for God. Until we don't kneel for, for God, we will not find any solution to any problem because we will not change ourselves and become fully the image of God in what we are and in what we do. No, Norman, can I say something about that? The key <laughs> thing for me, Monsignor, is what is God? Uh, and I, I, I believe in God as yeah. a cause of the universe. Scientifically, it has to be. It's a question of defining what that is. And if we say, if we take, for example, prayer, I don't think that praying alters God in a way that he makes my future change. I believe that prayer is very good, cheap, effective psychoanalysis. It's a very good way of having a community, and for me it's a good way of taking part in European history and culture. Sure. Now, an analysis of that, d does the church really believe that me praying to God means I can get a better future, I can pass my exams, or is there something deeper and more social that we, the concept we can develop? So it's those things, when you say it's a question of God, of course it is, but what is God? And it's that debate that had to be opened in relation to modern psychoanalysis and modern science. Okay. Could, could, <coughs> could I bring in the audience? There's a question here, microphone please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished panelists, I represent the University of Lower Syria as an Institute of Security and International Affairs. Also, I'm the former the NATO and the, the UN employee in the Middle East and the Central Asia. This is a tricky question to all of you. You mentioned something about the Islam. And uh, the last decade, the terrible uh, situation, geopolitical situation development, uh, especially in the Iraq, where is it called now, unofficially as a Republic of Iraq and the Levant, and also Islamic Republic of the Afghanistan. And the future predicted for those two countries, establishment of the caliphate, and you know, and taking, you know, as a, an example of the history, the, as a professor or who mentioned about the, the barbarism of the, of the Quran and the further policy towards the Europe and also the situation in some of the European countries. How you predict a situation development, it means uh, to, 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 to co cohesion, co co coexistence of the Christianity and the Islam in Europe. Thank you very much. Um, Monsignor. I, don't, I am not a prophet, not even a son of prophet. I cannot tell what will happen, but I believe the Islamic world is starting its era of Illuminism. And they need, I would say, this intellectual and even religious evolution or revolution to be at the world level respecting through tolerance, the meaning of others. Because everybody knows it's not true that the Quran just came down from heaven in its form. There was a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago, an um, exposition in Lugano of Islamic manuscripts in which we can see the evolution even of the Quran. But it could not be proclaimed so much because it's again the man attitude, because it's a globalization of faith to everyone. I believe it's why Illuminism is necessary to study, and the science may help in that, especially through the study of the, of the uh, language, of the manuscripts, all that, the history, to understand better Islam. But it takes centuries until it's down. For the time being, we are in a very dangerous moment, as we see in the Middle East. Uh, Wojciech, is that your turn? Uh, I, I have absolutely no qualifications to talk about uh, Islam and its changes. What I'm interested in is how the growth of Islamic population in Europe affects uh, behavior and doctrines and ideas of the Holy See, but also of the of the whole institutional church in uh, in Europe. And there, I think there are two types of reactions 
possible and aspects of both types of reactions are already visible. One is to treat Islam as a threat and a challenge to the position of Catholic Church and therefore to join certain, I'm using the word advisedly, bigoted societal attitudes of Islamophobia, for example, fears to building mosques, etc., and in a sense close ranks uh, against Islam. Another uh, reaction is different, is to try to create some sort of religious common front against secular uh, establishment with its uh, liberal attitudes towards religion as a whole. And uh, concerning the second reaction, I'm thinking about the responses to famous or infamous uh, so-called uh, Mahomet cartoons, Danish cartoons, years ago, where we saw this debate about freedom of speech and freedom of the press, where all churches, including institutionalized Catholic Church and also Jewish establishments came on the, so to speak, on the side and made an alliance with the Islam on the basis of the general protection of religious sensibilities and sensitivities against what was seen as abuses of freedom of the press. These are two possible responses. Both of them convey certain <coughs> threats, I think. What I'm going to say might seem a bit right-wing, and I'm not right-wing, I am a socialist. I work in the National Health Service. I'm more socialist than many people in Poland. But what, as a cardiologist, I have to decide, does this patient need a heart transplant? What is the best? Or do we carry on giving tablets for heart failure? And the best is what I have to decide. We're not prepared to tackle this problem with Islam. Is Christianity a super superior, and I say it again, a superior way of achieving human dis destiny than Islam. We can't talk about it. It's anathema. We're behaving like... <laughs> we're behaving like uh, people who are trying to, trying to please children all the time instead of saying this is a better way of living than that. The, the same might apply to the debate about whether it's equally valid for a homosexual couple to adopt children compared to a man and woman children. We're not allowed to have that debate. I don't know what the answer to that is. I do know the answer to Islam. Politically, separation of church and state is better than a caliphate. The role of women in Christianity, coming from the Virgin Mary, and then understanding of the nature of the human being in, in Christian philosophy, is a better way to live civil society than an Islamic approach, and many, many other things. So we have to have this open debate, honest debate, is a Christian tradition a superior way to live your life than an Islamic tradition? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think as a historian, I, I should uh, come in. Uh, I think the answer to uh, Islamism uh, probably lies within Islam itself. Islam is a huge community. Uh, and it's absolutely clear to me that every religion, that, even Buddhism, has a fundamentalist, extremist, violent wing. Uh, it's certainly true of Christianity. Uh, if it was true, as John says, that Christianity is about the Sermon on the Mount and nothing else, you would be missing a large part of European history. Uh, uh, as many atrocities have been committed in the name of religion as, as it were in the other direction. And it's absolutely true of Islam. Islam is evolving um, the larger part of Islam uh, does not appreciate the, uh, uh, the violent uh, extremes. Uh, and I'm sure that they can do more about it than, than we can from, from outside. Uh, more questions. I, I think we could be here until tea time. Um, people are, uh, have got questions. There's one here on the front row, please. If you could say who you are and then... Yes, um, 
Konstantin von Eggert, actually a participant of the forum from Moscow. Um, I have a remark and um, a question to Professor Martin. Um, a very quick remark to you, Professor Davis. Uh, well, I've spent a significant time in the Middle East working there, and uh, I think the problem with the so-called moderate part of Islam is that it's mostly silent, while the radical part is mostly very vocal and active. And I think that I'm slightly sick and tired of you know, kind of hoping for this redemption that moderate uh, Muslims will eventually have, maybe very well past my lifetime. Um, as for what uh, Professor Martin said, I think the question of leadership is something that is very important both religiously and secularly in Europe. And I think that Putin, who was mentioned a few times before, uh, has seized on this lack of leadership. And when you listen, especially when you are in this sort of Russian environment, you listen to what um, uh, the patriarch says and Putin's minions are saying, and it's all not anti-European, Professor Sadursky, in the sense that uh, we're against it. No, what they are saying, we are the true Europe. The Europe that is beyond the sort of the, the Belarusian Lithuanian border is fake Europe. We are real Europe of principles, of leadership, of determination and distinction. And I think that is even more dangerous than just being anti. And so my question is um, you said that. Uh, you still hope for the EU to provide this leadership. Is there a possibility for it actually to be, to, 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 to present itself in a situation where consensus has become, um, well, actually a substitute for religion? And uh, in these circumstances, of course, churches also have to blend into this culture of um, utter consensus, which I call utter conformism. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. For, for that very good comment. And, and I'm very much aware that Putin sees the Russian bloc with the Orthodox Church as a truth that is counterbalanced to the decadent European Union that is full of homosexuals and uh, liberalism and uh, that, that doesn't have a proper strong future. Nobody in Europe would ride a horse with his shirt off saying, I am the leader. <laughs> he would be with his... He would, unless he was a homosexual, then he, then he might <laughs> take, take his, take his shirt, shirt, shirt off. Uh, I, I, yeah, and, and we have to define again what is, what is leadership. Uh, leadership is, is strength, is vision, and is generosity. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, when I'm a leader, I'm very much now concerned about generosity that I, d I don't see in, in Putin. I don't know where that's going to come from in Europe. I really am at a loss. You're asking a very good question. We, uh, you know, in my own country, Churchill is put forward as a, as a, great, a great leader, a man of immense Putin-like strength, but had a vision related to European culture because he'd read novels, because he'd read philosophy, because he'd been in the British Army, a whole variety of, of things. And I don't see the sort of man or woman, Thatcher, Merkel, uh, who have a wide vision uh, that, that can achieve that. Part of the problem is the nature of European political parties that are not searching for truth or even nobility, that are fighting within themselves for small advantages and they produce leaders that are compromise. I uh, I hope she's not in the room. Baroness Ashton is the, is the, the present external diplomat of the European Union, she was put there as a compromise within the Labour Party of the United Kingdom. What a disaster! Just think if we'd had your Polish Sikorski as the external uh, uh, affairs uh, minister for the last five years, it would have been completely different. So I, I don't know what the, you're asking a very good question, and I don't know what the answer is. Thank you. Wojciech, something no, else? Monsignor, On okay. that topic, that. time is flying. Do we have... Oh. Yes, I can see there's a question here on the left, and afterwards, uh, madam. My name is Janusz Sobolewski, and I have a question. In the panel, I see only one priest. I think that what Professor Martin was saying is that the church is lacking 
intellectuals. In that respect, because it is not that we are talking here, there are certain people interesting in what you gentlemen are telling us, but the work has to be done there with the people who actually go to church. And I think that is lacking. That leadership doesn't produce actuals that they can explain this coexistence uh, of uh, religion and uh, science in a proper way. Even looking back up uh, for the uh, Polish uh, bishops, archbishops, they're close-minded people. So how do you expect to make that connection if the young people with the open-minded of a liberal Catholics are not going to come into the profession of a priest. Thank you. Thank you. So on that topic, I would say the church is not only the hierarchy, the, the pope, bishops, and priests. They have the responsibility as pastors, certainly. But do people read the documents of the church? Do people come to listen to the catechism? Do they come on Sunday to listen to the sermon? When you have some leaders like Cardinal Martini in Maryland, when we had Pope John Paul II during the world, people come, but they hear, they don't listen. This is a great difference. Because the appeal of the church through the pastors supposes a conversion, a change, and we don't like to change. I believe we are all responsible. And read again, repeat the letter of Pope Francis, the joy of the gospel. If you fulfill the proposals he makes, certainly the leadership will be given to the society by the church for the best of the society today. Thank you. John, do you have a word? Yeah, well, if I can say something very personal. Uh, when I was 17, I thought I wanted to be a Catholic priest in England. Uh, and, and I was sent to university in, in Spain to study philosophy. And then I went to the Pontifical University. Uh, and I decided I didn't want to do it. Uh, first of all, I didn't think I could keep a vow of celibacy. Uh, and uh, secondly, I had intellectual problems with the way that thinking was occurring and the way I was taking part in that. Uh, and I wanted more. So I, I went eventually to medical school in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, became a doctor. Uh, I, I think celibacy is a, is a major problem. Uh, I, I think women in the church and the leadership of women in the, uh, in the church and women in the priesthood is a major problem, Monsignor. Uh, but I think the primary problem was this intellectual approach. If somebody had said to me when I was 20, uh, let's really talk about what Darwin means in terms of the nature of the universe and the molecular structure of God, if he had a molecular structure, it would have been fantastic, but it didn't occur. It was too conservative. Uh, and, and coming back to our problem about leadership, I don't know where we get, we're, we're in a vicious circle of decline, of intellectual decline. Uh, and as it goes down, we have less leaders, we have more conservatism, we have more smallness. And I don't know how we get out of that. Yes, when it comes to Polish Catholic Church, obviously there is a certain, maybe it sounds patronizing or even arrogant, but certain intellectual decline in this sense that there was a time when some of the top uh, people in the institutional hierarchy were at the same time great intellectuals who quite apart from the fact that they were in the church would have been eminent and distinguished professors of science, metaphysics, etc. When there were giants, intellectual giants such as Karol Wojtyła, Józef Rzeciński, or Josef Tischner, just to mention three of totally different sort of generations and caliber, but that, 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 that was a time when Polish church uh, had happened to have those 
intellectual giants. I don't think that there is anyone of similar caliber in the Polish church today. So maybe it's just a matter of, of incidents. You know, it doesn't take that many. It takes three or five to impart certain quality and philosophical leadership or upon the church as a whole. So, but maybe there are certain aspects about, about the selection within the church. I'm, I'm not the one to make that judgment. I think there's time for two, yes, uh, two more questions. One is definitely here, and the next one will be there. The last one there. Three, three. Madam. Perhaps there's a third chap over there, Norman. He's been, had his hand okay. up for a long time. Three questions and, until we're thrown out, yes. Uh, Madam, yes. Mm, my name is Agnieszka Sieniawa, and I'm working for European Parliament. I'm an official. And actually, um, from the whole discussion, uh, my feeling is kind of pessimistic. I've heard words kind of, um, mm. we are living in a post-Christian era. Catholic Church, in fact, lacks of intellect. Um, and to be honest, as, um, I mean, the Catholic Church missed, he, Church missed, uh, missed uh, the boat. And in fact, to be honest, I don't agree with it. And um, I believe that we missed in the whole discussion today the, 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 the crucial word, uh, which is God. And I think personally that God will take care uh, you know, of the fact that the church will run, perhaps in a, another shape. Um, Christians, as uh, Monsignor said, um, is not only the institution, we, we are the people. The people is, is the church. We are the salt and the light of the world. And maybe what I missed it was um, how today we should evolve, what is expected, what we can give to the world. And if you could give me the sum of these optimistic tones, I would be thankful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Monsignor. So I come back to this uh, letter of Pope Francis, the joy of the gospel. You will find there all what you need to be, go ahead with the help of God. Because faith does not come from us, it comes from God. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, at, at the back, yes. Andrew Mikta, Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington. Um, I think it was Professor Davies who mentioned that there may not be very many Americans here. What I, what I miss in our discussion is actually a bit of the perspective from my side of the pond, so to speak, on what you're talking about. And I want to follow up on what Professor Martin has mentioned in reference to the question about Islam and Christianity and what's happening in the European debates on this. Uh, and I believe, sir, you said something to the effect that you would welcome some discussion of what is preferable, what is better, that you would welcome some discussion about the role of women, uh, science and whatnot, and how to structure society, separation of church and state. Uh, we tend to be much more religious, I would argue, at least overtly in America than most of the Europeans are. Uh, in a sense that actually religion is part of our daily existence, I think, in a way that's felt more intensely at the social level, from fellowship halls through you know, softball clubs, not just the church worship. Um, and I just wanted to raise a, a point here. Has the debate about Christianity in Europe not become almost something that the elite, by definition, puts some distance between uh, itself and what the quote unquote, the common practitioner experience is? It is not cool as my students would say, to declare yourself to be a practicing Christian or to declare yourself to be engaged. Um, and so this kind of relativism that creeps into these conversations uh, makes it almost impossible for you to actually, I think, uh, to go back to the roots of what constitutes the core of Europe, Europe's and America's tradition. Uh, I would be very hard-pressed to find a European who could actually say we hold these truths to be self-evident. And I think the sense of conviction that you have in America about democracy, about uh, political values, about political participation, owe a lot to the fact that we have churches that don't look like grand cathedrals, look like movie houses, where people congregate to talk in a very direct fashion about what is right and what is wrong and have the courage to go one step beyond what Professor Martin has said, that you would like to have a discussion, we would like to have an answer. We actually do make choices. We actually do say this is preferable. 
Uh, we don't yet, although we, we have a lot of European scholars in America right now who are trying to push us in that direction where everything is relative, but we still insist that you do assign values and you know, you, you, otherwise the only difference between a vegetarian and a cannibal is a matter of taste and America doesn't live that way. <laughs> we simply prefer Western freedoms, Western democracy, and maybe that's why we stumble into Afghanistans and places like this to our own peril. But I would urge and challenge my European friends to go back to some of the core questions as to what's better. Because I think it has built a gigantic, wonderful, rich European tradition, Western tradition. And we're all a part of it. And I apologize for making a speech, but I would challenge you, sir, to actually take it one step further. Because I have been to Afghanistan, I have been to those places. I know what it means to live not under a Western liberal tradition, where you can have on the one hand and on the other hand and blah, blah, blah. Let's actually try to think about defending what we stand for. That's my challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I normally say um, I wish we had more Americans here. Um, next year, perhaps we should make sure the debate is in the, in the, the middle, middle of yeah. the forum. Uh, very just, quickly, we've just very, very quickly, uh, you, know, you know I work in Yale as well, uh, where most of my colleagues seem to be Jewish actually, uh, and, I, and I, I love and respect them. Uh, I think we Europeans see your Christian movement in the United States uh, with some uh, lack of understanding. Uh, we see it as a immature naivety of a Republican regression, <laughs> uh, a pre, a pre a pre-Tea Party ma 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 manifestation. But I do take your point. You're very right in saying, what about the grassroots, the people on the ground, the foot soldiers? We're a bunch of intellectuals talking about, you know, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and uh, you, you're right. Those people, uh, my patients in my outpatients, I see lots of common people, and I think they do want a simple approach to their internal destiny, which is more than their disease and their molecular, molecular structure. And, and our, we, we are failing to do that. I, I, I do accept that. Yeah. Uh, one minute. Last question, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Machi Liti and I work for the public administration here in Wrocław. First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting debate. I have many questions. I'll just put one to the panel. Uh, and I will call upon an authority. Um, Larry Seedentop, his recent book, Inventing the Invi Individual, uh, in which he tries to trace back the origins uh, of the concept of individual starting in the, um, the uh, pre-Christian era and then going through the Christian philosophy, the scholastics, uh, and, and the, the evolution of the, the, the Roman law system. Now, he concludes the book saying that a part of the problem today is that there is a civil war between the secularism and Christianity. Now, would you agree with this framing from my point of view, it would explain some of the uh, idiosyncratic behaviors, like lack of proper leadership from the Catholic side. Maybe it's guerrilla warfare tactics. Then it would also explain some of the lapses, for example, the, uh, uh, the, some sympathy really emerging, and I agree with that point, uh, between a part of Christians in Europe and what Putin can rhetorically stand for today. So, do you think that this framing makes sense to help us the debate that we're trying to sort out? Monsignor. I give you as answer a quotation from Mother Teresa of Calcutta in the debate about problems in the society. What has to be changed? She just answered, I and you. Thank you. <laughs> John? <laughs> I, I've, I've read the book. Excellent. Uh, and it was reviewed in the Financial Times in London uh, in a very negative way by a professor of Islamic studies in Oxford. Uh, and, and I could see there the tension. It was, it, was, it was reviewed in an irrational way. And the, the professor from Oxford was saying, why didn't he mention Islam? He didn't mention Islam because it wasn't part of that tradition that's game, that we were all talking about today. But is there a war between civil society and Christianity? I'd never thought of it before. I think there is, and I probably think it's unconscious. 
it can do it's civil war, but it's unconscious in Freudian terms. There's lots of guilt in civil society about Christianity and, and vice versa. And perhaps if we, we, we tried to analyze why that was, it would be very, very helpful, particularly sexual morality. You know, where uh, most Catholic couples are not fulfilling sexual morality as the church would want them to. That must generate guilt and underground warfare, even though they don't know about it. That's just what, what, one, one example. But I, I think there is, you're, you're right, there, there is a warfare, and we can only unmask it by really trying to analyse what the problem is. Yes, Jake. Well, uh, yes. well, uh, I would like to address both very briefly this question and go back to, to the point made by, by our guest from Washington. Now, uh, civil war, I haven't read Siedentrop's last book, so probably civil war is too strong, but that is true that in many countries, such as in Poland, often relationship between Christianity and, if you like, secularism resemble something like culture war, Kulturkampf, and probably the which is a bad thing, which is not just a statement, but also an assessment, and, and probably the blame uh, is on, on both sides. But when, for example, the church decides to pick up the so-called gender ideology as its main target of criticism, and then associate it with all possible evils that uh, decadent uh, Europe, civilization of death, etc., you know that language, brings with it, then this is the sort of Kulturkampf which makes, uh, which makes uh, debate and compromise and democratic type of pluralism impossible. And probably some sort of extreme, uh, extreme anti-clericalism on the other side is a mirror image of that behavior. So I think that the very deep division and polarization within Polish society along some of those issues unfortunately resembles something like a Kulturkampf. But I would like to go back to the point that you made, sir, because I agree with you on one thing, but I disagree on another thing, and the point of disagreement is stronger than the agreement. Now, I agree with you that uh, we should be able to say some ways of life, some political systems, some systems of law and constitutions and liberty are, other, are better than others. And it's better to live in a liberal democratic society than authoritarian, oppressive, etc. And these are not relative things. I, I agree with that. What I disagree with you is this implied suggestion, because you started from the, if you like, deep religiosity and deep religious life of the US society, is that unless you have religious society and religious roots in this way, you are relativist. I don't think that's true. I think that, oh, if you didn't imply that, then, yes. the, okay, well, but so the, then uh, well, I, I'm not sure why you started with talking about how much more religious American society is, and then you are outraged about those relative Europeans who come and say things about, uh, so you can reach those what you call self-evident evident truths, which are only words. These are not self-evident, but these are compelling moral truths. If something is self-evident, then it means that it's a thoughtless process which led to it. But if there are compelling truths, you can reach them from different, if you like, philosophical and metaphysical sources, from both religious and secular sources. Yeah, I know that. Of course I know what you refer to. But, but this is rhetoric. To say that something is self-evident is rhetoric, even though it's used in the Declaration of Independence. Let him reply. Uh, Yes, uh, last word perhaps from Washington and then... Last word to Washington. No, I was just simply trying to say that, that I, I would argue uh, that even at the level of uh, elite politics in America, people do feel more comfortable uh, speaking in religious terms, addressing our religious heritage. It is not just a revival tent somewhere in Alabama where people are screaming, you know, and, and, and hollering. Uh, it is part of, actually yesterday, uh, President Obama in Warsaw ended his presentation with uh, what, what kind of a statement? God bless Poland and God bless the United States of America. I mean, this is, and it's almost instinctive. It comes from the gut, but it's part of our political discourse. And I think this ability to see a sense of value, inherent value in what the West represents and what democracy represents for us what I said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, make it possible for Americans to quote-unquote show up 
in crises in the world, sometimes barging in misguidedly, but always having a moral argument to make after the fact, before the fact, but always having that sense of making a value judgment. And I think this has a lot to do with how religion functions in America. Well, uh, I think we are, uh, let me just, one, one, one last can, sentence and, can, I'm, I guess and, I'm, and I'm done. Um, I do think that Europe has lost something, and I've worked and lived here for a long, long time, uh, in its inability to address directly this components of, of, of its identity. You're tripping all over yourself, trying to be politically correct, open-minded, understanding, <laughs> And in the process, you're losing something. Who? You really but are. Who is you? Who is you? When, well, Europeans. When I say European <laughs> political elites, yeah. I know I'm oversimplifying it, but too often in the debates, I hear these arguments, and it paralyzes the ability to act. Case in point, the Balkan Wars. I was actually involved in the whole process of the run-up to NATO intervention. I mean, it, it was one of the most pathetic, pardon me, moments for Europe, not just for the yeah. European Union, but for the European mindset. Yeah. People were being slaughtered on the continent, on the territory of Europe, lines were being drawn, debates were, and finally it took the Americans and NATO to come in and actually do something. And maybe, you know, maybe we are a little crass and primitive and whatnot, but we, we want to pass a judgment and we want to right the wrong. And I think Europe has lost some of it because it does not speak to those fundamental values that Christianity has in imbued European heritage with. So there you go, my stump seconds. speech. My stump speech. <laughs> 30 seconds. Can, can, I, can I argue that pound for pound, Washington, pound for pound per head of population, the British Army has done more intervention per number of population than the American Army? And so, and so has the French yes, army, not the German army. We must close, but we I, must close. Yeah. Uh, yes. Gentlemen, I, uh, we are rather running time, which is a very good sign. I should say one thing I didn't tell you about uh, my friend John Martin. He used to be a captain in the regiment of Gurkhas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in God we trust. Only adds to his global uh, vision. Uh, I have to thank everybody for their thank participation. You. We could go on for another two hours. Unfortunately, the room is needed by, by the next session. Let me particularly thank uh, Monsignor Perisse, <laughs> Professor John Martin from Yale and from London, and Pro Professor Wojciech Sadurski from Australia. Thank you very much. Next year we hope to have some similar event. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions about what we should talk about, please tell us about it in the bar afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.